Hello, and thank you for joining today's acquisition seminar hosted by the Federal Acquisition Institute. Today's seminar, entitled Lifting the Curtain, Past Performance, will offer valuable insight and useful information on the purpose, selection, and evaluation of past performance information that's applicable to both government and industry acquisition professionals. Okay, just between us, we know that past performance is like eating our vegetables. It's good for us. It's necessary. We don't always like it. Let's jump to that giant piece of chocolate cake, right? But like our vegetables, past performance information is important. And it's important not just for our colleagues performing future procurements, but also to our industry partners and how they respond to solicitations. The Office of Management and Budget and the American Council for Technology and Industry Advisory Council have collaborated on this new episode of the Lifting the Curtain series to address past performance. Before we begin, let me remind you that we will hold a live question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. If you have any questions about anything you see or hear, we encourage you to submit them at any time using the survey link to the right of the video screen. We'll collect and review your questions during the presentation, take a short break, and then return to answer as many as we can. And with that, let's get started. I'm very pleased to introduce to you now Melissa Gary, Procurement Ombudsman, U.S. General Services Administration, who will lift the curtain on past performance with a distinguished group of industry and government representatives. Hello, welcome to our session on past performance. The Federal Acquisition Regulation requires that agencies report and use past performance information on all contracts and orders over the simplified acquisition threshold. However, much discourse has occurred over the proper collection, application, and reporting of this important information. In the past several years, the Office of Federal Procurement Policy has issued guidance designed to help agencies improve the collection and reporting of contractor performance and integrity information so that better informed award decisions can be made. Inconsistencies and redundant solicitation of information have left industry confused and government inundated with information. Past performance is unquestionably a valuable factor used in selecting between competing offerers. Success in the past is a great indicator of future performance. The challenge is in constructing an effective way to gain true insight. There are inherent challenges because past performance is qualitative in nature, yet the procurement process dictates that we quantify it to a specific score. It is that process that we will explore today. The objective is to shed light for industry on how the government is developing and using past performance information and to help government understand how what we do impacts on industry. In this session, we will examine what past performance is and why the government uses it, what information is required, and how it's evaluated at various stages in the process, what industry needs to address in submitting past performance information, the sources used for collecting and reporting past performance, and ideas for improving past performance and collecting and using past performance information. Joining me today are a panel of government and industry professionals who will provide insight into the collection and use of past performance information. I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about where they work and what they currently do. Let's start with Mitzi and Jean. Hi, I'm Mitzi Mee with Excella Consulting. Excella Consulting is a hub zone and woman-owned certified small business that helps other small businesses navigate the federal government marketplace. Additionally, I'm the Executive Vice Chair of the Industry Advisory Council, and this topic is of great importance to all our membership, including the large, mid-sized, and small businesses, and I'm very glad to be here today. Hi, I'm Gene Zepfel. I'm with Coney Egg Services, Inc. It's an Alaskan Native Corporation headquartered out of Chantilly, Virginia. I've been in industry supporting government for about 30 years now. Uh, whether it be on the IT side or the consulting side, I've kind of seen a lot of the different acquisitions and different past performance applications in use here, and uh, I'm excited about being a part of this conversation today. Hi, I'm Chris Hamm. I'm the director at FedSim, uh, part of the Assisted Acquisition Service at GSA. 
Uh, we manage large, complex acquisitions for the rest of the federal government, and we use past performance and corporate experience and, and really want to talk about best practices on how we do that. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Baker uh, at the National Science Foundation. I'm a contracting officer for the Antarctic Support Contract, um, which provides operations and research support to the U.S. Antarctic program. Um, I have over 10 years of experience, primarily um, with the DOD. Thank you, panelists. So let's just jump right into our session and talk about what past performance is. Um, Chris and Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you all to tell us what is past performance. So let's talk about this as an overall concept first. Uh, the idea behind past performance when you're doing any sort of evaluation is to make sure that the company or the individuals that are supporting it have some sort of underlying capability and have, have demonstrated results at some point that is transferable to, to what you're trying to do in a future acquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a recommendation that you always evaluate past performance, but the methodologies that you use to do it, there are, there are a couple of different approaches. Uh, when you're doing an acquisition, you could ask for past performance questionnaires uh, that an industry partner would send out to their customers and then send back to the contracting officer. Uh, you could do research based on what's presented in the CPARS system and PEEPERS to be able to, to find out whether or not they've demonstrated quality in that, in that type of work before. And you can also ask for experience that's going to be listed in, say, key personnel qualification matrices of the people that are going to be assigned to whether or not they've actually worked on those programs and had demonstrated success. So you really have to th think about how you're going to evaluate past performance based on what you're buying in the first place. Mm -hmm. you're, gonna, you're not going to pick one because that's the default template. You're going to think when you're doing your acquisition planning at the start, what's the market look like? Do I need to have a lot of information around whether or not it's past performance? Or does your, past, or does your market research show that there are lots of companies that have done this in lots of places and so it's, it's less meaningful so you tailor what you're going to look at in past performance? Exactly. So past performance is really um, a likely indicator of future performance. And um, as Chris mentioned, we really want to tailor it to the acquisition that we have at hand. So Chris, you mentioned uh, references or questionnaires. What is it that the government looks for in those questionnaires or, or, or references, I should say? And, and are there key things that vendors need to bring out in those references? Most of the, the past performance questionnaires that are, are going out um, will ask for similarity in size, scope, and complexity to what the acquisition is that, that's currently underway. Mm -hmm. There's usually a rating scale. It could be uh, an ordinal math-based rating scale of rate their performance on one to five, or it could be an adjectival scale of whether or not it's, you know, comparable to what you see in CPARS, whether or not the performance was acceptable, or if it was good, satisfactory, was it excellent. Uh, what we're looking for is, is, in response to that questionnaire, meaningful feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the government side, we're aware that every one of the vendors is, has got um, some performance somewhere that is going well, and that's the place that they're going to send the reference to. Mm -hmm. you know, no, no customer, no, no industry partner is going to send a, a questionnaire to somewhere where they're struggling from a performance standpoint. So we already know that we should be getting positive feedback. What we're looking for is a meaningful response that explains exactly what that program is, because as the buyer on the government side, we're not working on that program. We're not aware of the underlying technical details of it. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking the, the other government's information back, and we want to see that they put time and effort and explain how it's relevant and mm -hmm. that we can understand it whenever we're going to factor that into our, our decision. Okay. Exactly. So with the responses that we receive from industry, we're looking to ensure that they meet the solicitation criteria for recency or timeliness and relevance. And relevance really is a discretion of the agency. As Chris mentioned, sometimes it can be defined as scope, magnitude, complexity, or we might, in certain instances, um, identify special interest areas or um, emphasize higher risk areas in a solicitation where we want to make sure that industry provides us past performance in that area. So one example could be on a site, on a security um, installation IDIQ contract, it's a very broad statement of work, but there's one special, really important high-risk um, area of the requirement, say, for example, the installation of a nuclear security system. So if we want to pull out that specific area that's a higher risk, we might do that in the solicitation and, and make sure that our um, contractors provide us any past performance that they have in that specific area, because the goal is always to reduce the government's risk when we're evaluating past performance. Okay. And I wanted to make a comment about mm -hmm. the whole, about that size, scope, and complexity. Because from a small business perspective, the small business may have the scope, 
but won't have the size and the complexity. A small business starts out smaller with uh, smaller projects and then goes larger and larger and larger. And each time they have to kind of stretch right. that past performance because their size is the, the, the size of the past performance isn't <clears throat> the size that you're looking for. Do you have any points on that? So, so go ahead. So um, I've read GAO uh, decisions where um, the agency, it's always the agency's discretion to kind of determine what relevance is and what is going to give them the highest confidence that a contractor can perform under the contract. So in all cases, scope, magnitude, and complexity is not always defined by the current solicitation. It could be, um, it could be defined as a, low, as a lower scope, and, and GAO has um, given agencies a great deal of discretion to determine what um, their evaluation is going to look like, and potentially, you know, it doesn't have to be this necessarily the scope of the entire, of, of the current effort. If you think that a solicitation is overly rigid, that you know you want to be able to participate to give us feedback early, if there's opportunities in a draft RFP or Q and A, or um, just giving feedback that you want to be able to participate and that you're an interested source in giving that feedback, um, if you don't think that you're going to be able to meet those requirements, and that's such an so, important point right. that you talk about early information to industry, right. so industry can give you feedback. Yes. I just want to add, whenever you're doing work that, that's going to be set aside for small business, or at least allows small business to participate, even if it's going to be competing against large, um, it always goes back to doing effective market research and seeing what the supply market actually looks like. It'll affect whether or not when you're doing your evaluation criteria, are you how many examples are you looking for, and whether or not those examples all have to come from the prime, or exactly. can they be team-based? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, whenever you're doing work that, that um, particularly what the annual revenue is going to exceed what the NAICS code size is of that small business, it's mathematically impossible for a company mm -hmm. to have three exactly. examples exactly. of that type mm -hmm. of work. Yes. But if they've been on a team doing effectively that same amount of work mm -hmm. and they're being proposed for this solution in that exact same team, that's mm -hmm. a meaningful reference that I want to get rather than mm -hmm. you being forced to use mm -hmm. other references that don't apply. So so you, you would look at the market space and decide, can you allow for team-based responses and past performance versus individual companies? So one more thought on the past performance issue here. Um, we've noticed that the government typically wants other government references mm -hmm. rather than commercial. Some state and local is okay once in a while, but usually mm -hmm. not. Could you talk a little bit about why is it so important that you have federal government experience and not allowing commercial industry experience, which in many ways is technically the same type of work? So I think that the preference for um, federal experience is that we have access to the systems that are official records. PEEPERS is an official system that we utilize to understand the quality of work. If we're relying on commercial um, commercial references, then we're relying on PPQs and we have to, to do a little bit more to understand. Um, it, it's just not an official record. In, in CPARS, the contractor always has the opportunity to respond to any kind of rating that is mm -hmm. given in the record. And so we like to use official records whenever possible. I'd also add that you know, I, I love the the private marketplace. You know, de democracy and capitalism, 100%. You know, that's that's the reason why we you know have contractors support the government in the first place. Is that's where you get all the technical innovation. That's right. Mm -hmm. The book I have to follow is a little thicker than the commercial book for buying. <laughs> yeah. And the marketplace um, does have nuances that you do need to be able to demonstrate success in a federal environment. That sometimes that that lessens our risk. It, everything always goes back to whether or not um, the, your market research has demonstrated that there is a, a viable commercial solution that you'd be contracting for in the first place. And so if you've done it in a federal environment, you're aware of some of the whims that occur within the government whenever we have administration changes, um, you know, changes in budget, some of the compliance requirements through federal acquisition are greater in commercial. So if I'm looking to buy something that is a brand new innovative commercial solution, I may seek out special commercialized examples for past performance. Okay. But if I'm doing a classic IT O&M job, I would like to know that they've done that in a federal environment versus then in just a, a pure commercial. It's going to get a better response out of the evaluators. Well, that commercial past performance yeah. could be their past performance as a sub to a larger company right. on a federal, doing that work for yeah. federal. Yeah, and, so. I, and I would definitely consider that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think we all can agree that uh, the references, the past performance information really uh, does influence the management and technical scores 
in a source selection environment. Right. Right. And what the government is seeking is to reduce risks, performance risks. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're, we're looking at all of this information. So uh, what happens if a vendor um, references past performance but does not submit that past performance as an official record? Is any credit given to that? No. So the past performance volume should yes. be um, evaluated separately. So anything that's referenced in the technical management, it can be considered, but really we're just looking to follow specifically what was identified as the methodology for evaluation of past performance. And we're not really going to be considering um, references in the technical management volume. So I'm going uh, I'm oh, yes. to agree, <laughs> but then talk about how companies yeah. use that yes. to shape outcomes on yes. technical and management. Mm -hmm. um, because if they have given us their two or three or whatever number of past performance mm -hmm. examples, right. and they also have delivered a similar technical solution in another agency somewhere, in their technical write-up they're going to say, by the way, mm -hmm. this is the team that delivered at that other place. Right. And right. while it may not show up in the written evaluation score of technical approach, it has given the technical evaluators more comfort mm -hmm. that the personnel and the, mm -hmm. and, and the corporate resources are familiar enough that you may end up giving them a higher rating because mm -hmm. it has influenced your, your, your level mm -hmm. of comfort that they understood right. your environment. Okay. So it, it doesn't show up in right. the written thing, but it definitely does show that the company has experience and it does add benefit if that company can demonstrate okay. that. In because the we typically, industry typically will do exactly that. Right. If mm -hmm. you ask for two past performance or three, mm -hmm. and we've done this 10 times, Right. In our narrative, we're going to tell you, and oh, by the way, we did it here, 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 and here, even though right. we only gave you one um, right. past performance yeah. or two past performances that you've asked for. And one of the things that um, is uh, concerning for us is that when you ask for past performance questionnaires, um, particularly on the smaller companies, we only have three or four mm -hmm. customers sometimes. Mm -hmm. We have to go back to that customer again and again and again it's very time consuming on the customer's um, uh, side um, obviously you're looking for that direct experience so talk a little bit about how do we make it okay or make it easier on our customers to respond to these past performance questionnaires so at the beginning i talked about the different methodologies mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that i would recommend is that you're not your default position shouldn't be doing ppqs um, doing questionnaires for every acquisition probably eliminates the, the actual benefit from, from looking at past performance. Um, a lot of the, the, the contracts that we're, we're talking about are awarded under existing IAQs. And someone has already done past performance mm -hmm. to vet the company's capability. Uh, so under you know, Schedule 70, under the you know, Alliant and Oasis small business contracts, and, and any you know, set-aside contracts that somebody's already awarded, the company's qualifications to do work has already been vetted. And so at that point, PPQs may not provide a material benefit. You may be looking at an alternative where you're looking at their corporate experience or you're looking at their information presented in CPARs rather than repeatedly asking companies to provide that information because okay. it's already been established that the company has a qual qualified past performance to be on that vehicle in the first place. So that's good advice to the acquisition professionals right. in the government. Yes. We in industry are responding, yeah. right? Yes. We, we can't drive that. We right. really don't influence right. that. Mm -hmm. But right. I think that's, that's great advice to the So um, at the National Science Foundation, as the contracting officer for the Antarctic Support <laughs> Contract with Lockheed Martin, I've received several PPQ requests from other agencies, some that say that they don't have access to the PPR system. So what we do is we answer the questionnaire as much as we can, but we also then we attach to the PPQ our most recent CPARS um, evaluation of the contractor. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to get a, a our preference is to not have to answer PPQs and to direct them to the official um, system, but. We do, we fill out just the basic information of the PPQ and any um, qualitative assessment. We just, we don't answer those and we just attach our CPARs because we don't want to um, conflict with any of um, the, the ratings that we've given in CPARs because a lot of times the PPQs will come in with a different rating scale and it just doesn't match and we want to avoid any com um, conflicting information. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, what you're, we're talking about, Chris, with these government wide vehicles the primes tend to be larger. You know, we, we have a lot of small businesses that are, you know, very small that are starting out that won't have a CPARS, right. that won't be able to qualify for a vehicle right there. 
So that's a whole different, a whole area of our past performance is really important to them, how they can get it and what they can do. Right. So let me, let me ask you all, is, is there any benefit to referencing work that did not go well? I mean, even if it's in the context, <laughs> even if it's in the context of, you know, what you learned from the experience, is there any benefit to that? And I think, Chris, you mentioned earlier that, you know, people are going to always go to their best, oh, you absolutely. know, references. So as Jean mentioned, you are limited with sometimes with the number of um, responses that you're able to provide. So my recommendation would be to provide your best um, the best references that you can. That's not to say that the government, GAO has um, stated that in certain limited circumstances, the government is um, not, is obligated, not, it's not at their discretion to consider other information that is considered too close at hand. Mm -hmm. So close at hand, uh, an example of that would be p ignoring past performance of the incumbent contractor when um, either that's poor performance, um, you can't ignore that information. It's considered too close at hand. So even if they don't submit a reference for that, you, the government is obligated to consider it. And conversely, if you do consider it, um, you have to consider all aspects, positive and negative. You can't just focus on the negative in your write-up because you don't want to appear biased or prejudiced against that offer. So you have to consider the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. right. For the, the smallest of the small, uh, the position is always that if they don't have demonstrated past performance or corporate experience, the default is a neutral, neutral. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. versus a negative or unsatisfactory mm -hmm. kind of deficiency uh, approach. Uh, th there's also a, a, a different understanding on whether or not you, you would include that in past performance or a PPQ versus how you would talk about that in a technical narrative or for a lot of our evaluations, we're using oral presentations. Uh, it can be very powerful for a project manager who's giving a presentation to talk about a situation <coughs> that wasn't going well and then how it was fixed, because mm -hmm. that's, that's demonstrating that they can be mm -hmm. agile and react. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it shows effective management policies. So you can blend that into a technical approach, but mm -hmm. it usually won't show up in the past performance right. information. It'll only show up in the, somewhere in the technical volume or in the presentation. Right. And, and I'm just curious if either of you can think of any examples of awards you've given to companies where they got a neutral past performance. Can you just, is there anything that you can think of top of mind? Now, when we're doing new acquisitions, a lot of our new software acquisitions are using agile methodologies mm -hmm. and a lot of companies don't have the number of, uh, so we do yeah. have neutral ratings on a number of our smaller acquisitions. I think it's really important when we do, before we give a neutral rating that we've done a lot of, you know, that extra additional research to see if there's anything out else that could help us um, determine um, performance risk for that contractor before giving that neutral which rating. Goes into so, guns, which goes into so that, that actually opens an interesting question. I don't know if I'm hearing that right. In the RFPs, it will typically say we will evaluate past performance in the following way. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, we submit responses to that. Um, do you have the opportunity to score from information which is not in our proposal? So like if you saw we, we were doing a project for X company or X international organization and it was a positive thing and you saw it as a good thing, mm -hmm. you could give us additional points for that? Or is it just on the negative side? If you saw we were at the, on the cover of the Washington Post, yeah. nobody wants to be on the cover of the Washington uh, Post, you could take points off so for that. In, so in, how does, how in does general, work? you follow the evaluation <laughs> methodology that you've listed in your technical evaluation plan. Okay. And okay. so if, if I said I was going to go look at sources mm -hmm. of past performance information, such as CPARs, okay. I can go and look and then use whatever information that I've located. Okay. If I'm using past performance surveys, I'm pretty much limited to the survey responses I got unless it's the close at hand mm -hmm. where you were an incumbent on the job and you didn't use that as past performance submission, that's a pretty telling it sign. Is, it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> and, so that, that, can, that can influence a, a past performance rate. But typically the government always reserves the right to seek additional information yeah. and use that if necessary. So, and, so, so I know that's always gonna, an option. Right. And it just depends on the, the requirement at hand and the level of um, risk and if the extent of which we're going to go seek additional information. And, and what past performance doesn't do for, and I'm speaking more from the small business, mm -hmm. of course, not the large, is talk about a company's financial, a small business's financial viability. There could be, they could have great, but they could be on the brink of not being able to pay their employees. So that that's always a consideration too. And 
and it doesn't seem that, that the federal government has the ability to go to really to do that as much. I, I think that comes later in the process when they're it's making responsibility, responsibility. determinations. Mm -hmm. They look at their financial, mm -hmm. you know, um, but not at the standing. Not the yeah. technical no. violation. No. Uh -huh. right. So one, one request, if um, mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to talk about um, debriefs today, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I would love to get that kind of a debrief. If, if my, mm -hmm. my proposal was evaluated with um, external information, mm -hmm. that would be wonderful mm -hmm. feedback as part oh, of the yeah. debrief if I didn't win mm -hmm. the particular opportunity. So. Right. Uh, that's, that's those debriefs session. Oh, that, that's excellent. <laughs> that, yeah. Those need a lot yes. of help. I think those need yes. a lot of work. We we yes. we put so much time and energy right. and money into this, yes. mm -hmm. and then to get a unsatisfactory debrief, even upon losing, is is right. not satisfying. Right. So talking about that later would be great. I also yeah. can tell you that I'm getting more corporate response to our CPARS evaluations. Uh, we have a, a rule inside of GSA, it's 100% compliance for CPARs. That is not true government-wide. Um, the, the, mm -hmm. the database itself is not fully utilized for all acquisitions. Um, but we're seeing other customers start to use it for a source of past performance information. And so questions about how to effectively challenge a CPAR, what's the right window of time and how to influence whether or not the agencies um, would be fairly in providing information into there, like whether or not there's a corporate expectation for the five-star rating, you know, the everything's got to be exceptional versus mm -hmm. that. We're, we're, I'm getting more calls from vendors that want to talk about how to effectively manage that system because people are using it more and more for best. Mm -hmm. So for, for us in industry, I think this is a, a great conversation. It, it is. We experience, and I've been in large and small companies, we experience CORs and COs that frankly don't pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I have firsthand information on it. And being an executive in a large company, we've had to create a strategy to how to manage the government's attention to make sure that the CPARs are actually entered into the system on time and they reflect accurately mm -hmm. the work that we've done. So I know we have a process to review and we get to review them and then we get comments back, which is great. But uh, we are more actively managing that mm -hmm. in industry now than we ever were before mm -hmm. because we're now seeing uh, procurements mm -hmm. where past performance is 100% dependent upon the CPAR. And that's pretty yes. scary when you don't mm -hmm. trust the process. Right, and right. we have to spend attention trying to manage the government's process on that. So that's, right. that, for us, that's something that mm -hmm. we need to keep thinking hard about and figuring out how to work. Yes, yeah. and, and OFPP has taken great effort um, and leadership focus on improving the system, train, offering training, sharing best practices, doing quality sampling of uh, CPARs, and you know it, the the CPARs metrics are you know receiving great attention at the leadership level. So we are focused on improving that system. Um, when agencies say that they give us the line that they will not give any better than a satisfactory. That is their practice. It may not be a policy, but that is their practice. And yet we're competing against other past performance from other agencies, yeah. which give lots right. of high mm -hmm. ratings. We don't that feel that's fair. So right. evaluation of how that process works and the system works, I think would be very helpful. I think you might yeah. want to find the ombudsman from that organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so one of the things, as you said, you're yes. managing the, the comment period. It's important that you make sure that in that in your comments that you, if it's not already in the narrative, the narrative is the most important part to a source selection decision maker, not necessarily the satisfactory rating. So the, the, the narrative needs to match the, dis, the definition of the ratings. But... You know, in some cases, that rating, you can't really give more than a satisfactory, but that should be clear in the narrative, and it should say that there were no deficiencies in the performance, that mm -hmm. this this type of requirement is not one that could exceed a satisfactory rating and that there were no issues. So it's really important that the narrative is clear, mm -hmm. and we're working on improving the quality of that, and we want industry to make sure that during the comment period that if you, you're, you're able to... Um, you know, provide feedback on mm -hmm. that, that you do mm -hmm. that. And so that when a CO sees that in a response to a solicitation, they can see and that you did a that good job. Up. That mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with the satisfactory rating? Mm -hmm. I mean, it says you're, you performed you at the full mm -hmm. performance level. So you did exactly what you were supposed to do. I, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. However, um, it goes back to the way the RFPs are evaluated. Mm -hmm. If the RFP has a five-point scale, 
and we get a mid-grade mm -hmm. that's okay. no better than neutral, we would be better served to not spend any time at all and submit no pass performance if all we're going to get is a neutral. Because it's very, it takes time and energy and money to do that past performance work. So why not just not do it at all if all you're going to get is neutral? And it, where it gets frustrating is when we see our performance, and yet other companies' performances in the similar space mm -hmm. is clearly not as effective as ours, then we believe we need to be rated differently than that. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's all subjective. I'm not, I'm not right. going to talk right. about a specific example, <laughs> right. clearly. But when the agencies say you can never do better than satisfactory, and yet the RFP is giving mm -hmm. you more points, the evaluation giving you more points for higher ratings, mm -hmm. it's a discontinuity that we just don't have much influence over. And right. it's points specifically? It's not a like a trade-off um, evaluation? It, they're, they're assigning specific points to that rating? Uh, it, it, okay. it, whether it's point, whether it's okay. quantitative or okay. qualitative, okay. It, yeah. it doesn't really, you know, either one, right. but okay. you get more points, if you will, okay. quote unquote, with, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. whether it's qualitative or quantitative, it's not. And a lot of our small businesses will say, my average CPARS is a, you know, 4.9. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. when they're, when, and they okay. will put that in their, their literature when they're yeah. talking to potential new clients, and so okay. they've gotten a three sure. on something that's sure. It is meaningful. Okay. I mean, yesterday was prime day, and, and I did sort by four star ratings on everything that I was looking at to make sure that, that for yeah. a commercial supply, so, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, there is an influence on whether or not. Uh, the averages overall, if there's a high number, the end mm -hmm. is high, then you know you're showing a high level of satisfaction. So I, I would try and address the uh, the idiosyncrasies of an agency that's not using the same scale right. as what mm -hmm. everyone else is. Yeah, right. that's not what we want. There there needs to be consistency. So who do we talk to if there's exactly. an agency, and I can name five right now? I won't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we just believe are not really doing this in the spirit, I think, with which it is intended. Mm -hmm. Just what is industry's avenue to ask that question? I would say the small business representative of the agency, if you're a small business. Um, okay. I mean, if, what if you're I a large so. business? And there's, I mean, the, the policy comes from the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. Okay. Um, I know they, they have this blog called an open dialogue, and they encourage industry to submit their comments. Okay. That would be a start, you know. Okay. Get Great. get them aware of it because they're the ones who issues the policy, who issued the policy for the federal government to follow. Mm -hmm. So, it, and if there's inconsistencies going on amongst agencies, okay. they certainly should be aware of that. We also care a lot more about data now. You know, we want to make sure that we're using that information effectively. Yes. And so most senior procurement execs uh, have some sort of feedback mechanism, an ombudsman or something, in order to make sure that we're mm -hmm. complying, they're measuring compliance, and, and that, that there's a, a certain outcome, you know, that, that the performance under the agency is well. So mm -hmm. there should be a feedback mechanism in that individual agency okay. also. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So, I mean, based on our conversation today, um, I'm going to pick on Mitzi and Jean. Great. Um, what is it that you think the government is looking for with regards to past performance information, and how do you decide what to provide? Well, I think the federal government's looking to mitigate the risk. Yes. So, and once again, speaking from a small business perspective, lots of times you can only decide, you, you only have a few things to choose yeah. from. So your decision is, makes it pretty easy. But one of the things when we select a client, our first question is, do you have any government past performance already? Federal government past performance, because it really does make a big difference to these to this these small businesses getting that first one. That's the federal government. Mm -hmm. In fact, we we talk to when we do work with a lot of small businesses, we tell them you really probably need to sub first. You know, mm -hmm. you really shouldn't mm -hmm. try to out of the shoot prime something, mm -hmm. but to to mitigate risk. And then once again, from a small business perspective, lots of times it's it's just what you've got. You've only got two or three past mm -hmm. performances. So I'm looking for, so the small businesses are looking for business in the scope of business that falls into those few past performance they have. Then once they get those, then they can try to maybe go out to other different different mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, Mitzi handled the small business side. Let me talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the large business side. Mm -hmm. Um, even the, the large businesses will have limited past performance, right? There's a lot of big companies out there, and while a big company may have four or five good past performance to choose from, there's always that 80-20 rule 
the top few are really the, the important projects that people recognize. They're the right scale, they're the right dollar amount. You know, they're mm -hmm. just really gold star uh, projects. And that's where it kind of goes back to, we have to keep asking our customers, those same customers mm -hmm. for references. Um, but we're, what we're trying to do with past performance is really show we can do the work, make you mm -hmm. feel comfortable, we can do the work. Um, but also we're trying to tell you that we can bring capabilities from other customers where we've done this before mm -hmm. that you may not have today. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you're an incumbent, it's a little bit different. Your biggest past performance, if you're doing well, is your, your incumbent uh, past performance, obviously. But I know the government is always looking for new innovations and new mm -hmm. blood and new interest. They don't just want to keep turning the crank mm -hmm. on the same job. So we do look to bring different customers. Um, I've worked at companies that are combination commercial and federal, and we routinely try to bring at least one commercial past performance because, like you said before, a lot of innovation is happening in an industry. Mm -hmm. We can pair a commercial capability along with making the government feel comfortable. We know how to do this in mm -hmm. the government space. We hope to be able to bring um, the best of both. Mm -hmm. And going back to that risk mitigation, that's why I think it's very important for the government to evaluate past performance of the team, of the prime and the sub, because you may have a, a smaller prime, but you have a you have a larger sub, which is going to mitigate your risk mm -hmm. if you look at their past performance, to look at overall team mm -hmm. past performance. So we, we've talked about the issue of small businesses or new companies that don't have much past performance. What else does the government, and, and I'm going to turn to Chris and Elizabeth on this, what else does the government look at besides the company's past performance uh, questionnaire or information in CPARS to determine if there's a potential performance risk? <clears throat> so we, we touched on this, but let me, let me go further into it. Um, my organization's default evaluation methodology has a, a number of evaluation factors and everyone always lists them in you know, the, the right order of importance. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always looking at technical approach as the number one most important mm -hmm. evaluation factor. Mm -hmm. Usually I'll have management approach as mm -hmm. number two or key personnel and project staffing as number two. Mm -hmm. And those two might be the two and three. And past performance or corporate experience is usually my lowest rated mm -hmm. evaluation factor. Mm -hmm. And I do that mostly because the work that, that my agency mm -hmm. supports um, is using existing vehicles where past performance has already been evaluated. So I care less about determining uh, past performance capability out of a company when they've already had that test done. And so what I'm looking for more is in the technical approach and in the key personnel and project staffing, whether or not the individuals that are proposed as key personnel have delivered a similar size, scope, and complexity project, and if they have worked together as an existing team. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did a project uh, that was a, uh, integrated IT and a new construction project for the DHS headquarters at St. Elizabeth. And the, um, the team that was proposed on that was the one that had just finished building the exact same technical design for the National Geospatial Agency. Mm -hmm. So that was a past performance reference, but it also is a key personnel strength because mm -hmm. that same team mm -hmm. has already built a building together. They already know how to do the technical design and their technical approach is comparable. That's right. like the slam dunk of taking right. 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 capability into deliver. So it's how you, you weave those things mm -hmm. together and to get an effective, that's mitigating all of my risk at mm -hmm. that point. That's how you get excellence. Great. So um, in the instance where we've, the government has already mitigated its risk, um, we also want to make sure that we're not overcomplicating the source selection where we have mitigated risk. So one example of that is where the Air Force decided to waive the past performance evaluation for a um, over 500, anticipated $500 million theater radar. So they waived the past performance because they took three companies through the technology development phase um, and so that really reduced the government's risk. Mm -hmm. um, so they decided it going into the in engineering, manufacturing, development, and initial production phases that they weren't going to evaluate past performance because they had extensive experience with those companies, those three companies for the down select. So another key point is to not overcomplicate the, um, the source selection. As you mentioned, if you've already had that past performance, then um, you've made that a, a lower, lower priority in the, mm -hmm. in the evaluation. Sure, sure. Um, and we talked about this a little bit too. Um, I know some agencies only use information contained in papers or, or government uh, experience. 
But can the government use uh, commercial uh, references? Absolutely. Um, and, okay. and again, it really is tailored to the acquisition. I've seen um, solicitations that have um, requested, you know, have made it available for commercial mm -hmm. references to be provided and mm -hmm. submitted. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on the sort of Other sources requirement. would be yes. state and local governments. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So, I mean, that's government. But mm -hmm. the, the point I'm making is that we should not or we ought not to just rely right. on the information in papers. Although okay. in experience, just in, in my years doing this, I, I do feel like the federal government does feel better when it's been done someplace right. yeah. else in the federal government. Well, because once again, that goes back to mitigating risk right. that we talked about. Right. And it's a similarity. Mm -hmm. in, in, um, but with the newer technologies, as you were talking about, the agile development methodology, there's just not that much. So yeah. it's forcing you to do that. We, the commercial. we are seeing a lot more federal experience. Uh, the, the shift to agile mm -hmm. development mm -hmm. um, really got footing in about four or yeah. five years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we're seeing more federal examples. But originally, no, it, it yeah. was you know, teams that had delivered a natural software development in a commercial environment that was more powerful yeah. than somebody saying that they did it, but when we know that really they were just doing waterfall in a room. You know, it, 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 it did change the, the evaluation methodology. Yeah. And weren't those, were, were most of those awards that you, were they smaller? Yeah. So, yeah. so we've talked about the uh, various sources for collecting uh, past performance information, what the government uh, looks at. Um, so as we continue down this path of improving past performance and collecting past performance information, I'm going to throw this out to Jean and Mitzi. Is there an innovative way to demonstrate past performance to the government? So how, how can you bring innovation into your um, proposal that would um, correspond to what we're trying to do to our requirement? So I think Elizabeth brought up one good example um, is a multi-step acquisition mm -hmm. process sometimes is very helpful. Mm -hmm. If what you, the government asks us to do is to build a solution or demonstrate an agile approach or bring a technology to the table, show us that you've done it and make that part of the selection process, you down select from 50 to 10, whatever the numbers actually are, um, I think that gives us an opportunity to show you we can actually do it, not just talk about it, not just write about it, mm -hmm. but actually show you. Um, I think an improved uh, past performance system, mm -hmm. CPRC peepers, etc., mm -hmm. um, could add value if there was real content in it versus just opinion. Because mm -hmm. reality, it's opinion, mm -hmm. right? You're asking the COR, the CO, the CO to make an opinion on performance. And this goes back to the availability of data. Like, were we really on time? Were we really uh, within budget? I mean, yeah. that data is available now. If you can integrate that and bring some more hard numbers to the table, I think that would be very helpful for us because we're happy to live by the real numbers, but you all have to have access to that data. Mm -hmm. And today you don't really have access mm -hmm. to that data. Which would make the whole proposal process a lot easier if you didn't have to worry about doing everything on the past performances. If you had it someplace to go to get it that mm -hmm. was consistent and mm -hmm. all those things, it would make it easy for industry mm -hmm. as well as for, as for government. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we talked about um, earlier is, with, with it's not so much about innovation about past performance, but it's, it's how letting industry know as early as possible what the past performance requirements mm -hmm. are, because that basically, uh, for industry, sets up how you team. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know till past what the past performance requirements are going to be until the RFP comes out, and I mean, you can always... Uh, assume size, scope, and complexity of the, of the work. But if you don't know if it's going to be three or five or whatever, those decisions by the government greatly impact industry and their teaming decisions. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely agree. And I think even though I, I'm sure you all have heard that our cycle to make a bid, no bid decision mm -hmm. is sometimes 18 months in advance of a mm -hmm. procurement. Mm -hmm. That's plenty of time for you all to go out to industry put a draft RFP out there, mm -hmm. put draft past performance. Okay. We want to make a decision at least a year before RFP. Mm -hmm. If we wait too much longer, the good subs are gone, 
<laughs> we really won't have the ability to build a capability or flesh out a capability we think we would like to have better documented, better formed for this opportunity that you're trying to buy. Mm -hmm. um, so I know it feels odd that we need it so far in advance, mm -hmm. but these are very expensive things mm -hmm. for us to, uh, us to pursue. And it's not unusual at all to spend a quarter million or millions of dollars uh, mm -hmm. just to pursue an opportunity. And we have people we work for, whether it's individual investors or mm -hmm. Wall Street or whatever, we've got to go defend our budgets to be able to pursue something, being able to say, I've seen a draft, mm -hmm. I have a strategy, and I'm a year away from an RFP much more uh, better for us and much better for you, you're going to get better solutions. And, and better right. competition. So yeah. the more, more you can communicate, the earlier you can communicate and the more you can communicate, mm -hmm. and GSA is very, always very good about that, the better for both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And even the, the acquisition forecasts mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. GSA makes, that each mm -hmm. agency makes, yes. very, very important. Now we know it's a, it's a moving target, mm -hmm. right? And lots of things happen and lots of yes. things change. But the sooner you can tell us your acquisition approach that you can share, mm -hmm. the past performance, the, the basic scope, the contract vehicle you're going to use, okay. hugely important. Mm -hmm. If you use a contract vehicle that I don't have, then I will either not pay attention mm -hmm. or I will go find someone who does have that vehicle. Again, that takes time. Mm -hmm. If you can tell me in advance you're going to use Alliant, you're going to use CIOSP, whatever, whatever you're going to use, very, very helpful for us a year or a year and a half in advance. It is interesting how we, we've connected the concept of past performance to how government and industry interact uh, because people would not naturally make that connection. But we have seen a chilled relationship between government and industry. Protest rules uh, have, mm -hmm. protests have increased, which then makes mm -hmm. government contracting officers more risk averse. Uh, in general, there's yes. the, the reluctance to interact in advance of a, a solicitation. But uh, FAR 15201, very clearly, meetings one-on-one -on -one with industry to do market research, develop understanding of what the world looks like, would be how companies could then form teams that can bid on our work, which then gets our solution is to be better. Same. We need to get back into that mindset where the, the contractor workforce is just as committed to serving the mission of the government as the government is. And we just want to make sure that once we get into the solicitation phase, that's when it's fair and equal access instead of the upfront part. Right. I think it's critical to get industry feedback in developing our solicitation, either feedback or on how to improve it or questions that are not clear. We want to make sure that um, industry is very clear of, you know, how we're going to view prime over sub um, past performance. Mm -hmm. And you just that mm -hmm. all of that needs to be very clear. And the time to do that is prior to the release of the solicitation so that we have that open communication with everybody and we're posting answers to questions on FedBizOps so everybody has the same access to the questions. Um, it's very important. So, and, and we appreciate that feedback and I know we need to continue to improve uh, open communication with industry. And I would almost recommend, this may be too much, but I would almost recommend two drafts. I know it sounds like a lot, but if your yeah. first draft has a past performance approach or methodology you're going to use which has got a left turn in it that's mm -hmm. a right turn a left turn in it mm -hmm. um, and then we act on that we make a decision based on that and then you come out with the final RFP and you change it mm -hmm. that changes everything so mm -hmm. the kind of the final draft sure. Sure. should be really on target for where you want to go you've already taken all the insight you've taken all of our input yes. you've made your decisions now clearly we're not going to uh, argue about those decisions that you make but changing it late in the game is as bad as right. not making it in the first place. Absolutely. I've seen multiple drafts, draft RFPs yeah, yeah. released and multiple Q&As, like five yeah. sets of Q&A sessions that are posted yeah. individually. So yeah. depending on the complexity and the risk of the requirements, you know, that's going to drive that and yeah. the timing that we have to allow for that. Well, I, I'd just like to add, too, that when the government holds an industry day event, especially a pre-solicitation mm -hmm. day, we're still doing market research. So that's an opportunity for industry to kind of help shape the requirement. And so. an interesting thing about that, so these industry days, I'm mm -hmm. glad we're talking about it. Um, lots of times, the industry day, as you said, is for market research and decisions haven't been made, yes. yet mm -hmm. government expects industry at that industry day to figure out the teaming, but we can't because mm -hmm. we don't know, the questions haven't been asked. Is it, right. a is it a large or a small, is it a set aside? 
yeah. what's the past performance. So it's kind of interesting that there's so many dynamics to that teaming decision yeah. that until those questions have been answered, we can't do the teaming. So the, that industry day is great for us, mm -hmm. but you know, it, sometimes it's, well, maybe the industry day should be after that those decisions are made so that when you have industry in the room, they can do that networking and that and those mm -hmm. discussions about mm -hmm. teaming because we know what the requirements are. And, and yes. I would say, in, in my experience, industry days are generally the government push mm -hmm. of here's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. No one asks questions at those industry <laughs> days. At least people who are worried about competitive stancing, sure. yeah. Yeah, there, that's, there's that's no way problem. I'm going to ask a competitive question in a forum of a mm -hmm. thousand people. Right? Yeah. So that really is a push. Mm -hmm. Your RFIs, your market research, your drafts, much more valuable. Sorry, they're both valuable, mm -hmm. but we really act on the information in those um, draft RFPs and the RFIs. And, and actually, I'd like to ask a quick question about the RFIs. Um, bringing it back to past performance, when you include a brief request for past performance in the RFIs, that helps us a lot mm -hmm. because we want to tell you the good things we do, but if you look at our response and you say, you know what, these guys can't, not even in the ballpark, right. give us that feedback, okay. mm -hmm. either it, through your next draft or through mm -hmm. your results of your market research. Yeah. Give us that feedback so that we don't waste our time and money on something we know we could never win anyway. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. One of the things I've been advocating for in my own office, and I'd love to see it go wider than that, um, RFIs are for different purposes, and we call them all RFIs. Mm -hmm. There are RFIs that are for market research for corporate capability. There are RFIs for technical innovative ideas that we're trying to figure out how mm -hmm. we're going to buy something. Mm -hmm. And there are RFIs for whether or not they're for socioeconomic concerns. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're structured very differently. They're asking mm -hmm. different questions. And sometimes they're used to make a set-aside determination when we also have other facts that are also in it. I think we need to do a better job of calling the uh, the request for what they are and then right. then the company's yeah. going to understand what what information right. we're going to use in order to decide and then do an industry day or a you know. right because a, a lot right. of the small right. businesses won't respond to the RFIs when you're talking about the ones for the sources to see whether it's right. going to be set aside because there it kind of goes into a black hole they do all the work and and then they never hear anything about right. it they're never invited back to talk they're not you know, mm -hmm. and so that would be very helpful. Kind of figure, trying to figure out what what are you trying to accomplish with this. Right. I'm trying to get a dash after RFI to say the intent yeah. behind the RFI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, the feedback that I hear too is that you're absolutely right. Oftentimes it does go into a black hole, but yet industry has spent the money and exactly. the time mm -hmm. to respond to this RFI, mm -hmm. and nothing comes of it. But if I spend the time to respond to the RFI and you you give me feedback or you say, all right, great, come in and, and meet with me or let me know what's going on with it, then it is really worth mm -hmm. my time mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah, even if the feedback is no thank you. <laughs> it's not a procurement decision. That's right. Don't, try to, don't right. worry about hurting our feelings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we get over it very, very quickly. Because yeah. yeah. we lose a lot. We yeah. lose more than we win. Yeah. And we're used to it, right? Mm -hmm. We're used to it. I would rather be told no yeah. very early in a date sure. than no <laughs> later in the date. Yeah. Yeah. To use yeah. a bad, bad yeah. analogy. Sorry. We, we, we do that occasionally with uh, an advisory multi-select or even a competitive yes. range yes. where you're using that as an initial screen. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll send a letter, which you know, it, it sounds a little mean when you're saying company X has not done demonstrated capability and you know, requirement why, but you now say, all right, we're not going to pursue that one. BNP now goes to the next job. Right. Uh, right. People don't continue once they get a, I don't think you're going to make it. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the we call it usually a deal review yeah. board. The, the folks who are making the decisions about what to invest in, mm -hmm. if you get a positive response, yeah. yes, you've made the competitive range, or here's a positive yeah, your experience is reasonably on target. Yeah. Huge enthusiasm goes behind that one. But if you don't get a passing grade, you step away and go find something else to pursue. You don't waste your time and money. And then to um, go back to your comment about industry days being information pushed to industry, um, a lot of times they'll do breakout sessions and one-on-one -on -one breakout sessions too early on. So hopefully they're, you know, if it's a, if, if it calls for it, that they're doing those individual yeah. sessions so yeah. that you can bring up those questions that you have in that, you know, without having everybody else in the room. I, I love those. I think those are great. And actually, I know we always want to do a one-on-one -on -one because we want to dance in mm -hmm. front of you, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would be happy <laughs> with a telephone one-on-one. -on -one, sure. Right? right? You can do 
eight of those in a yeah. day. One on one's industry face to face. You can probably do four a day. You're right. It, it's really very powerful for us yes. to be able to even just yes. talk, or God yes. forbid, we get to video conferencing yeah. at that level. <laughs> yeah. um, but that interaction is very helpful. Mm-hmm. And what we find oftentimes is you don't have enough time. Right. <laughs> you don't have enough resources right. to basically deal with all the companies that are mm-hmm. coming at you. Find a way to make it mm-hmm. a little quicker and easier. That would be more helpful than make fewer of them more mm-hmm. complicated. Because if government doesn't engage with industry and there's and it's, this is more on a recompete, then really the incumbent has so much. That's as long true. as the incumbent's mm-hmm. doing a good job, the incumbent's got so much power because mm-hmm. nobody else. Where you know people won't. A lot of companies won't bid on things where they haven't been in to talk to the client. Mm-hmm. They don't feel like they mm-hmm. know what the hot buttons are. And and you know you can say you get a lot of that out of the RFP, but. Mm-hmm. And, and Mitzi just went through the list, right? If mm-hmm. I'm on an evaluation team yeah. deciding what should we bid in, yeah. have you talked to the client? Mm-hmm. Do you have past performance? Did you do a response to the RFI? Was there a down select? Mm-hmm. Is the incumbent well liked? I mean, these mm-hmm. are the questions mm-hmm. sure. that we go through mm-hmm. making decisions about that. Mm-hmm. And you know, past performance is always yeah. one mm-hmm. of them. If you can't prove to an internal friendly audience, mm-hmm. That you know how to do this and have done this before, yeah. You're no way you're gonna co- you're gonna convince a client that, that you know how to do this. Let, let, let's delve into that a little bit further. Um, incumbency, you know, obviously they have an informational advantage, oh, and there's sure. there's usually a perceived resourcing advantage. Uh, but how you lose as an incumbent is to make your entire proposal about your past mm-hmm. performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, we uh, we did some statistics on our uh, civilian acquisition point. market, and uh, we had seen that incumbents were successful only 50% of the time right. on our large jobs because the the default solution from the technical from the incumbent was what we're doing you here. know who we are <laughs> and like what we're yeah. doing so and, and I've got a, an evaluator's like they didn't address these mm-hmm. like seven questions in our evaluation factor <laughs> exactly. like they just that's a not acceptable response yeah. mm-hmm. and so you can lean too heavily on past performance and not actually read the documentation and mm-hmm. do it properly can mm-hmm. I also that's suggest that the, the 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 past perf- the, sorry the incumbents not winning has something to do with how hungry the market is as well. Mm-hmm. When there's not enough funding in the mm-hmm. system, mm-hmm. the companies are looking for whose lunch can we eat. Mm-hmm. And then they will get more aggressive with a solution or a price. So mm-hmm. a lot of it is it's the competition is getting mm-hmm. sharper and tighter uh, because there's fewer opportunities to pursue. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. I'd like to go back to the, the issue of questionnaires and uh, Mitzi and Jean, do you all feel a, a certain level of frustration having to go back to the same clients for references? Well, it's not so much our frustration, it's the government persons that we're having to go yes. to. I mean, of course we don't want to, well, you know, will you, will you sign this for me, do this mm-hmm. for me again? Yeah. We know they're busy. And, and so, like I said, it's really the, then it makes it really more for the government, harder on the government than it is for us. Mm-hmm. But you don't, and that, but that goes all back to, again, small business and the fact that they only have a few past performances and you've got to go back to the well. Right. And, yeah. and, it, and actually, it's kind of nerve wracking, right? I mean, we're relying on our customer to make a recommendation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if they don't yeah. file the paperwork on time, we're out. So we have to put pressure, which we nobody likes to put pressure on your customer. Exactly. We have to put pressure on your customer, your current customer not just to yeah. open the email, right. but mm-hmm. God forbid, to fill out the document the and then send it to the right person. Yeah. And, and, so, if you're, and if you're bidding on a lot of things all at once, then right. your customer can go, well, wait a minute, what, what about, how are you going to take care of me? And, and I've had a customer say to me, my leadership has told me to stop responding to PPQs. Mm-hmm. And yet other customers are saying, I have to have PPQs. So there's mm-hmm. still a disconnect in that, in that mm-hmm. system. What happens if one of your customers is just an easy grader? I mean, I, that doesn't necessarily yes. say. <laughs> <laughs> then you're going back to them every time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, but yeah. Think that doesn't say that you're you're one of the best out there, yeah. though. Press hard you know? three copies. <laughs> That's absolutely true. It doesn't say that. The, the issue is we these are all people, mm-hmm. right? And different people have different measures. Mm-hmm. Some people say satisfactory is showing up every day. Mm-hmm. Other people say satisfactory is delivering on time, on budget, on mission. Every mm-hmm. single day. That's two different levels of performance, yeah. Yeah. and people are going to rate those. I think that's why, back to Chris's idea, 
where we, yeah. when we can get harder data mm -hmm. and we get more data available that it can be more quantitative mm -hmm. it can never be purely quantitative because opinions mm -hmm. will matter right but just more data points i mm -hmm. think would be would be very helpful yeah, so we're trying to solve a behavioral problem mm -hmm. uh, i usually try and do that through improved system design mm -hmm. and uh, so this is my personal opinion not the position of gsa or fedsim <laughs> <laughs> or the federal government <laughs> But I am interested in your feedback on it. what if we um, made changes to the nature of the system. Uh, the, the, the CPARS system, um, design-wise, is you know, not current. Uh, it, its front door is a little dated, and it re it's asking for information that really is at the major system level. I mean, it's asking for subcontractor performance, and mm -hmm. you've got, I don't know how many, but like 17, 18 different data fields that mm -hmm. you've got to fill out. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to do annual reviews, and you know, it's, a, it's a chore. On the COR side, and then on the or, and then the AO, the approving official side, to be able to do that review. What if we change the direction of it? What if the initial input came from the contractor performance versus from the, the government having to enter it in, and then it was more of a management by exception on the COR side? Would that be something that industry would support, and then we would be able to get faster and easier use out of that system? So I'll give you my opinion. Again, mm, my opinion not, only. Yeah. It's not industry's right. opinion. Um, that's pretty much what we started to do. Mm -hmm. We started to write the CPARs for customers. Now, obviously, we, they cannot and they should not take what we say verbatim, but a lot of the COR don't like to write. They don't know how to write. They, they, it's a chore. If I can give them something to start with, mm -hmm. I do that. And now yeah. we've been very sophisticated about that in terms of looking at even financial performance or regulatory compliance. Well, we're compliant in a lot more ways than satisfactory, and here's how. Right. And we run through the eight ways mm -hmm. to do that. So I do think us starting that process, mm -hmm. I mean, the good companies are all starting to do that, mm -hmm. sophisticated companies. The smaller ones, it'll be harder, but everyone will kind of get to that. Uh, I think, though, from a change the system process uh, perspective, we all saw Facebook, although I don't do Facebook anymore, but we all saw Facebook move from a thumbs up, thumbs down to, I think, a five scale mm -hmm. or a three scale, whatever it is. Um, if you could make the PPQs an online yes-no with a little bit of narrative and you make it a single transaction for the client that is going to have to fill this out so that they get the email, they open the email, they click here, they answer the three, four mm -hmm. yes-no questions, they give ratings, mm -hmm. etc., quick narrative, they're done and they're out, mm -hmm. that's not the way it is today. Today, it's a Word document, right. you got to cop copy it, place. sometimes it's a hard copy. I mean, from a system perspective, I will fill out a survey if it's quick and it's mm -hmm. right there in my email. Mm -hmm. I am not going to go through three steps to be able to respond. And to if you help. haven't responded in three days, you know, you get the reminder. So then I, I assume you're, you guys are all for some type of standardization of Absolutely. these forms. Yeah, and yeah. As, as much as we all like to think we're independent and individual and creative, <laughs> the, the reality is mm -hmm. when we can all get more standard, more consistent, right. well, most companies will feel it's much more of a level playing field. Exactly, that's mm -hmm. what I was going to say. It's leveling the playing yeah. field. Right. That's mm -hmm. what we right. want. And can we take, so the, take the chore out of the task? Mm -hmm. Make the real mm -hmm. objective of the task collecting a true opinion rather than can you write? Or can you fill out a Word document? Can you put a stamp on it? All those kinds of things. Right. Make and, it simple. And just making it a lot easier for our government clients to right. mm -hmm. not have right. to do all the heavy heavy lifting with this. Mm -hmm. When they have to do, I don't know how many they would, could have to do in a year mm -hmm. to fill in. So I, I think my next question uh, centered around um, satisfactory equating to full performance. <laughs> um, and, and that's the highest rating you can give. And I think we've already mm -hmm. discussed yeah, that. Mm -hmm. So um, given that, um, are, are there any more things that you guys would like to address? Well, I, I think from an industry perspective and, a, and, a, and really a small business perspective, although this does apply to mid-size and the largest, it's about open communication, mm -hmm. open and often, letting us know what your requirements are for past performance as soon as possible. And I think because to, to allow government to know how big a factor that is in us for teaming, not only teaming, but a decision whether to, uh, to even go after something. Yeah. It's just sure. so, so important. So the more we know, 
sooner, the better for competition, the better for industry, the better for government. I agree. Yeah, and I know we've touched on this a couple times now, the, the additional data available. Um, Chris or Elizabeth, any thoughts on what kind of quantitative data that you'd either like from us or are available in other systems that you'd like to see as part of a past performance evaluation process? Well, I think it's, again, it's going to depend on what is requested in the solicitation and how much, what level of effort the contractor, contracting officer thinks is needed to mitigate the, the government's risk. Um, they're going to potentially do interview, you know, pick up the phone and call other contracting officers. They're going to research other publications. Um, really, it just depends on the, the situation, uh, the, the requirement, and... Um, what is asked for in the solicitation. So GAO and COFC are always going to, um, w when they go back and look at an evaluation and how it was conducted, they're going to consider was the contracting officer reasonable and did they follow the criteria that was in the solicitation? Did they apply, you know, apply all the required regulations and statutes? And then did they document it? So as long as you know, the contracting officer follows mm -hmm. what was in the solicitation, that's critical. And then did they document it? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the extra level of effort, the additional information, if they want to see anything extra, they're going to probably ask for that in the solicitation specifically. But um, the level of effort for additional information we seek uh, just depends on the requirement, the complexity, and the risk. Um, and there's just there's a number of, of avenues that we can take to get that additional information. It, it, it may end up being just the market space that, that my agency works in, but it seems like we've got to a point where past performance or corporate experience uh, gets to a compliance exercise mm -hmm. where you can you're not going to win based on your submission, but you can lose. Uh, it gets to where you know, you're showing that you have competence and you might get, an adjectival rating of an acceptable or a good, but I mean, even if you got an excellent on it, it's the lowest one in the hierarchy. And it, it's the other factors that tend to, and so when we get uh, challenges, protests, or, or even stuff that goes to the court, it's not based on past performance evaluations. That's mm -hmm. how you're getting eligibility to bid in the first place. Okay. So it doesn't tend to be the discriminating factor. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really technical approach and whether or not we followed our procedures. Okay. And I just wanted to add too about how a small business kind of enters the federal government marketplace. Once again, I've said that we recommend that our clients sub and mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. build up enough, but, yeah. but still that sub past performance, it's kind of, you yeah. know, it's commercial. It, you know, if the federal government understands how mm -hmm. that's how it works, mm -hmm. but that's not how the past performance really is set mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So if, if some type of change could be made for that, mm -hmm. realizing that we want, because that's what you should want. You should want yeah. your entries into the federal government marketplace Absolutely. to go to work, to work for a, a larger company and get, and get the experience working in the government marketplace and the via, but mitigating the government's mm -hmm. risk because the the prime has has more experience there, mm -hmm. and then as they mature, move into mm -hmm. in that prime past performance. But like I said, that's just the system's not really set up that way. Yeah. Um, Right now, I, I, I do want to add one thing that we, we haven't touched on, but what I'm, I do see out of small businesses as past performance examples, uh, where they'll count an entire vehicle that they've won. Uh, they, you know, they've been awarded an IDIQ, and they use that in order to get to size, scope, and complexity. Uh, vehicles generally are not past performance, and mm -hmm. so it, it, it's done mm -hmm. for in order to get in to be a compliant bid. But it, it is very difficult for a government evaluator to see that you know you you were awarded an IDIQ somewhere. Mm -hmm. We we don't know if you actually won any task orders. We don't know if any work was done under it. It just was there. So there's a big eye popping number, but you know it, mm -hmm. it it ties our hands a little bit because it it might have the scope and total dollar value, but we have no proof of execution. Mm -hmm. Then we have to go back and look at more. Right, and yes. our solicitation should be clear on mm -hmm. when you know we're going out for bid for a large IDIQ. Are you know are we looking? Yeah, you know, defining scope is it the entire or right. or are we looking for past performance of, on that task order level? Yeah. Well, and I think that get, gets back to the core definition of past performance. It's it's performance done under a vehicle or a contract that's similar in nature to mm -hmm. what we're mm -hmm. trying to acquire now. Mm -hmm. So. So that brings us to the close of our session. But before we conclude, I'd like to leave you with some key takeaways from the session. Evaluation of past performance is important in the source selection and award process. 
Past performance information provides the government with a means to assess potential performance risks. Past performance should also be a powerful tool for motivating contractors to perform well. Past performance as an evaluation factor is distinguished from past performance information or relevant information about a contractor's actions under previously awarded contracts. Knowledge and awareness of how past performance is evaluated are critical to successful proposals and the various alternatives for proposal instructions and evaluation criteria have a big impact on how industry responds. Finally, the government is striving to improve collecting and reporting of past performance information. Doing this more effectively could be a great value to the procurement process. I would like to thank our panelists for this lively and informative discussion on past performance, the collection, evaluation, and use of this important and critical information. It is my desire that through this discussion, both government and industry now have a better understanding of how past performance information is used, the challenges, the impacts to industry, and why more efficiency is needed in the process. Thank you. Have a great day. We're glad you've taken the time to experience this great conversation about past performance and its utility for government and industry. But the learning isn't done. Now our guests will take a few minutes to answer the questions we've received during their conversation. Thank you all for returning to the question and answer session for our acquisition seminar, Lifting the Curtain, Past Performance. Our panelists are still with us, so let's jump right into the questions we have received from you, our fantastic audience. The first question that we have, can you address the past performance system, accessing the system to provide feedback on the contract and to review specific companies' past performance on federal contracts? Who'd like to answer that question? I'll take that question. Yes, the system that's being referenced here is the CPARS PEEPER system, which is a system for collecting past performance information on vendors. You can access the system by creating an account and logging into it, into the system. From there, you can input uh, comments on your performance and you have access to only your company's performance. Sounds good. Now, from the federal employee perspective, though, how would they get into this past performance information? Again, they would have to create a system. They Same. would have to create an account Same and log into the system. Excellent. Okay, really good. Well, then let's take a look at the next question that we have up. What do you do when faced with a PPQ that does not match what's in Peepers? What something that doesn't match the Peepers narrative? I found some offices would rather keep poor performance out of a CPARS review or just give a good review in order to avoid the hassle. So who'd like to tackle that one? It's a little more complex here. So I'll take that. This is Elizabeth Baker from the National Science Foundation. Um, it's always our preference to use the official record when possible, the official record peepers. Um, we, ha we have an increasing emphasis on the quality of the narratives in the system and so that it becomes a more effective tool for our contracting officers and, and source selection decision makers. Um, if you choose to um, request PPQs and you get a negative, you get negative feedback in a PPQ that's not in an official system, then it's incumbent upon the CO to reach out to the contractor in um, discussions and get, give them the ability to comment on that negative past performance that wasn't documented in an official system of record. Sounds good. And say, to be fair to our audience, we're starting to sound a little bit like an alphabet soup here. So who could define for me PPQ first? What's PPQ stand for? Past Performance Questionnaire. Easy enough. And then PEEPERS? Past Performance yes. Information Retrieval System. Outstanding. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Then let's move along to the next question that we've got. Since we have CPARS, why would we have to respond to a separate past performance evaluation request? Somebody that has emailed us something directly. So this is Elizabeth from the National Science Foundation. I uh, mentioned early in, the, in the webinar that sometimes, like for example, on the Antarctic support contract, I've received PPQs from um, other agencies. 
and I, and I go back, what I do is I call them, I call that contracting officer and I say, you know, we have this information in CPARS, can you please use the CPAR, or the PEEPERS system? And what they've told me is, in, in these two instances, they've told me that they don't have access to the system and so what we did was we completed the PPQ as much as we could and um, just, the, just the basic information and then attached our CPARS evaluation to that PBQ and submitted that to the contracting officer. So that's how we kind of handle it at the National Science Foundation. Okay, sounds like we might need to do a little bit more work within the federal community, making sure everybody has access to the system or help them understand that they do have access to it and maybe they just don't realize that then. Okay, good, let's jump to the next question we've got. This is a long one, everybody stay with me. The Professional Services Council developed two model forms, a past performance information form to be included with solicitations and a past performance questionnaire. Here we have the definitions, fantastic, to solicit feedback from previous customers that will standardize and streamline the collection and use of contractor past performance information. The intent is to integrate these into the PEEPERS CPAR system and subsequently into the integrated award environment for central access. Are you familiar with this initiative? And what are your thoughts on implementation of standard forms as a time and cost saver? Who'd like to handle that behemoth of a question? I'll take the question. Sounds good. Yes, I am familiar with the initiative, and I think it's a, a terrific idea. It's a way to standardize the information that we collect. It makes it a lot easier for contracting officers to uh, intake and uh, evaluate um, the performance of a vendor. Um, it will, in my opinion, be a time and, and cost saver across government. So I think it's a great idea. Sounds good. Okay, well, let's hustle over to our next question, number five, also a fairly involved one. As a core or contract officer's representative, I certainly agree with the value and usefulness of past performance in selecting a contractor, but ironically, the CPARS we're required to submit regular performance evaluation reports to is not available to us as cores for future use in researching past performance of competitive contracts in the future. This is frustrating knowing the database exists but not available to the scientists making up the proposal evaluation teams, including the future core, who will be making award recommendations to the contracting officers or CEOs. Is this access restriction government-wide or perhaps limited to our or my particular bureau? So this gets back to that access question. I can take this question. To my knowledge, there is no prohibition on CPARs in terms of the acquisition folks who are given access to the system. I, I would recommend that you talk to your contracting officer or maybe even your senior procurement executive on getting access to um, the system. Again, it's, it's to my knowledge, there is no restriction on uh, prohibiting cores or even program managers from accessing the system. Okay. So it, it, it is not a government-wide uh, requirement. So probably just some uh, mentorship amongst us as federal employees of, of how yes. to navigate the system and get the information we're looking for. Yes, and it, it, it could be an agency-wide decision. Very good. But Very not government-wide. Okay, let's go along to question number six that we've got. Even if a contract is not performance-based, should a contractor still be evaluated? We have a cost plus fixed fee contract. So how do you deal with that? Who'd like to handle that one? I'll get that Very one. Good. Uh, regardless of the contract type, whether it's fixed price, time and material, cost plus fixed fee, the federal government needs a way to evaluate the bidders. They have to make sure that the awardee is capable of doing the work or supplying the solution. It's a way to mitigate risk, so therefore they have to ask for past performance, some mm -hmm. type of past performance. Right. Got to be fair to all of the bidders, all of the potential contractors that you've got on board. Okay, so again, let's go along. Next question here. I believe past performance is influential for determination. Yet when you receive a poor performance incorporated with good performance, how do you justify the determination if that particular vendor contractor has performed with the government for many years? Is this relevant, especially if his offer is beneficial and best value for the government? Do I select with consideration of past poor performances? So I'll take that. Um... 
Past performance evaluations are subjective in nature. And what I would recommend for a past performance evaluation team is that they, after the first set of their initial write-ups, that they get some feedback from their legal team, have them review their write-up, their evaluation write-up, and let them know if they're on the right path. Does, does this write up come to the logical conclusion of the rating that they that they kind of identified. And that that's an early gauge as to whether or not they're, you know, when you read through a write up mm -hmm. with including poor performance and, and and good performance that a logical person could come to that rating and that and get that legal advice early and that way that can shape the rest of the evaluations. Again, work as a complete evaluation team. Don't try to do these things in a vacuum. Right. And okay. and get feedback from legal early. Very good. So. Okay. All right. Next question for us then. Is there a preference between three-year versus five-year past performance for evaluation purposes? And would that be for government or for industry? Do you have a preference one way or the other? Uh, let me take that from an industry perspective. Okay. Uh, from a, and from a small business perspective. From a small business perspective, five years is better because, as we've discussed, past performance is always an issue for small businesses, for these companies. It would give small businesses a larger pool of projects from which to select and may enable them to bid more. This would be, of course, better for the federal government because it would increase competition. And as I say to industry, you can't win if you don't bid. So the more past performance they can have allows them to bid more and hopefully win more projects. Exactly. Competition is a good thing. Yes, as it we've is. we've been, been saying quite a bit. Okay, really good. Next question that we've got. How does an 18-month lead time on requests for proposals address the government's need to respond quickly to changing conditions? Uh, that's a great, and whoever asked this is a great question. What industry really is looking for from the government is a dialogue so that we know what's going on. We love RFIs, sources SOTs, industry days, draft RFPs, and we always know that bidding, uh, at, you're subject to what, what's in the RFP, so that gives the, the federal government time to change. So really, we understand that government is going to change during this 18th month. It's just letting us know in far enough in advance so that we can engage and we can come up with a strategy. And once again, this all leads back to competition. The more industry knows about what the government is trying to do, the better for everybody. And not really just competition, that's just communication and yeah. engaging with industry, potential partners who are going to help government employees, government work be done better, and right? We don't, and we don't need to know everything mm -hmm. at, at, you know, until the RFP comes out, but the more we can, we can learn faster, the better. Sometimes you can't, because I would think in an IT arena, Things turn over exactly. extremely quickly with the programming, the languages, whatever mm -hmm. might be available. But like you say, as much as possible, just keep that engagement up and you'll be ready when you have to turn on a dime. The statement of work could change right up to the very, very last, but at least we would have the framework with which to work. That sounds good. All right, next question. In today's world of one to five star ratings on Amazon, Yelp, Uber, etc., so many different things that you can see online, why can't buyers view an aggregated summary of PEEPERS data for various categories of spend and then drill down on the individual narratives to understand why performance is high or low? This would seem to make past performance information much more accessible and valuable to the users. So who would like to handle that? I'll take that one. I think, um, I think we all use Amazon, Yelp, TripAdvisor, whatever, to get an idea of performance, what it is, whether we're going to take a trip or buy something. I think uh, the government's faced with kind of a conundrum if we aggravate ratings. Uh, as discussed earlier in this, in this particular presentation, there doesn't seem to be a uh, standard for whether a performance is graded satisfactory satisfactory or excellent kind of depends on the agency policy on on how their people are given guidance on how to rate performance if that particular process was a little less subjective I think uh, you could aggregate ratings based on data and not subjective evaluations I think for the time being uh, the process isn't there yet, and you're going to have to drill down into the actual performance narrative to really see uh, the capability of the vendor you're looking at. Otherwise, 
you might get a false impression of performance by looking at a uh, aggregated rating at this point in time. I think that's a great discussion point, and I think uh, we need to continue that conversation with the owners of CPARs. I mean, that would be a great item for them to look at and figure out if there's some way to make that uh, standard rating so that they can be aggregated to save a little bit of time. And maybe we can set up aggregated ratings as a future acquisition seminar. We'll try to do something like that. But unfortunately, we need to stop here because that's all the time that we have for our question and answer session. Now, if you asked a question not answered, we'll try to work that into a written response that we will post with the recording of this seminar in the Federal Acquisition Institute's media library. So I'd like to thank our panelists for all of their answers here today. And I'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for these fantastic questions that you've submitted. As always, we hope you found today's seminar very educational and useful in lifting the curtain on past performance. The Federal Acquisition Institute thanks Melissa Gary for leading our exploration, as well as our panelists, Mitzi Mead, Gene Zapfel, Chris Hamm, and Elizabeth Baker. And of course, FAI thanks you, our viewers, for your time and attention. Remember to eat your vegetables, but now you've earned your big piece of chocolate cake. We'll see you next time.